How to make a very simple but very useful DMX tester that fits in your keychain. In the lighting industry we have a transmission standard, well a data standard called DMX512 and it allows you to control a lot of channels along just one twisted pair. But when things go wrong with that, when you've got uh, open circuit connectors or shorted connectors, because DMX has no error correction or detection, um, you can get weird effects. It's also very, very tolerant to uh, floating connections, so unfortunately it will make it look as though it's good data. Uh, let's draw this out. So imagine that this is the lighting desk desk. Normally it would have between one and, well, no upper limit of uh, universes, each universe being 512 channels. So this has a data cable going to the receiver, so we've got plus data, we've got minus data, and we've got ground, which is also used for the screen and is just general reference to the electronics ground in the circuitry. So we've got the two data lines go across and they go to the receiver, and the receiver has the ground connection connected to its electronic reference ground as well. And then it loops onto the next light. And you've got a buffer here. And the data is transmitted using an electrical standard called RS-485. So let's type RS-485, which is capable of driving uh, cables quite hard and uh, running signals long distances by having a fairly low impedance that it can actually put quite high current out to these, even though it's just about 5 volts but also to allow it to reject common mode interference that is influencing it from adjacent cables. It uses a system whereby it toggles the data lines. So say, for instance, if it was a 1, it was transmitting, this line would be positive and this line would be negative, and if it was a 0, this line would then go to negative and this would go to positive. And it is just usually between 5 volts and 0 volts, although technically speaking, the DMX standard can actually go down to like almost like millivolt levels, but different differential, which is where a lot of the problems in receiving crappy signals come in when things go wrong. So this uh, receiver is a fairly high impedance, so you can loop lots and lots of lights along. And you can get lots of problems occur. You can get shorts between, say, uh, in a plug or along the cable if it's been chaffed, you can get shorts between a data line and the screen, or you can get shorts between the data lines, or you can get open circuit data lines. And uh, one of the worst is probably open circuit ground, uh, because the data is still there, and it can generally, it will tend to try and use mains ground as an alternative often, and uh, because the voltage can vary, because they're not tied together, you end up the situation that the lights may work part of the time, but then they'll just jitter and start going berserk at other times, and it's, it's very disturbing when this happens in the middle of a show, or when you're trying to hunt faults down. So I find that this little tool, uh, which goes in the keychain, is incredibly useful. And all it is, it's really, really simple. Uh, DMX uses uh, either 3-pin XLR or 5-pin XLR. The original standard specified 5-pin, but because it's cheaper and in many ways more rugged, um, the some of the companies switch to using 3-pin. The connectors are often a lot cheaper than the 5-pin. And they're also very popular with the audio industry. This is a downside because sometimes people use audio cables and whereas audio is going to have an upper frequency of about 20 kilohertz, the data being transmitted has a sort of upper theoretical frequency of about 250 kilohertz, 250 kilobits a second. So you'll often get off with it for short runs of audio cable, but it's not really recommended. So if this is the XLR connector, what we're going to do to make this tester is we're going to have pin 1, pin 2, and pin 3. It doesn't matter if you're using the 5-pin or the 3-pin. Uh, it will just be pins 1, 2, and 3. The original standard of 5-pin specified one ground and two pairs of plus and minus data. Uh, but it's very rare that you'll actually find they get used, although some people use them for auxiliary control functions. However, whether it's a 5-pin or 3-pin, you're going to use pins 2, 1, and 3. The reason I've written them in that sequence is because it makes it easier to draw the circuit we're going to do. So there's a couple of options here. There's the LEDs. A couple of options. The first option is that you could have taken the two data lines, plus and minus, and you could have put a single resistor from plus to minus and gone through inverse parallel LEDs. And in the earliest testers, they were just those bicolor LEDs that had just two pins 
red and green. And the idea was that it would show presence of data on the two data lines. The downside of that tester is it doesn't uh, tell you if there's any continuity. It doesn't check the ground at all. And the ground is actually quite important, the ground and screen. So that kind of worked okay. And you'd get the, if you got just red, um, it meant that the data lines were stuck in a, in a fixed state or green, it was stuck in a stick, fixed state. If you got the, the shimmering sort of orangey colour between the red and green, you kind of knew things were okay-ish, but it's not infallible. The better tester has the plus data and the minus data and the ground, and it has a resistor and an LED, and a resistor and LED for the other one going to ground, And typical values would be 220 ohms, 220 ohms. And this way, it will test if there's a broken line, because uh, this LED won't light. That line, if it's broken, this LED won't light, or if they're shorted to ground or shorted to each other, neither of them will light. And the uh, if there's a broken ground, neither of them will light again. Will light again. So it's a very good comprehensive test. It, it works a lot better than the older traditional one. So... To wire this up, it's very simple. If this is uh, the terminal for pin 1, you connect the negatives of the LEDs to that. It could be the positives. I would recommend having the LEDs going in the same direction because, technically speaking, if you ha put the LEDs in different directions, even with the ground floating, you you'd get continuity through the LEDs and it would look like they'd both light uh, with the data. Uh, so uh, they have to be in the same direction. So that's the negative of the LEDs. The positive of the LEDs are just a resistor connected between pins 2 to one LED's positive and pin 3 to the other LED's positive. That is it. The reason for the use of red LEDs is because they've got a 220 ohm. They've got a lower voltage, typically about 2 volt. And also the red LED technology versus the modern gallium nitride, blues, greens and whites, it's more rugged. It will handle electrostatic discharge and things like that. It will handle reverse voltages. It's just a better technology for this application, even if it's not quite as bright as the greens and blues. So I would say stick with the sort of brightest red you can find. The resistors can be uh, eighth watt or quarter watt. I'm going to use quarter watt here just because it's what most people will have. The smaller eighth watt ones will work absolutely fine. The dissipation is typically only about uh, 0 0.02, 20 milliwatts or something like that. It's going to be nothing. So let's build this and I'll show you how easy it is to make this. So we're going to use a standard XLR connector. This one came from CPC in the UK. You could also use Rapid Electronics. Uh, it has, uh, if you're elsewhere in the world, CPC is part of the Element 14 group, so you'll find lots of companies associated with that. So if we take it to bits, we see that there's the insert. And I was mentioning, I mentioned, let's say it zoomed down a little bit to this. I mentioned uh, on Patreon because I did an earlier version of this video which I screwed up completely. I got my recording, uh, actually recording and pausing out of sync. So I recorded the bits I wasn't supposed to record and vice versa. And then that was later in the video. I checked the first part of the video, released it to Patreon, and then got lots of weird messages from people telling me what I'd done. Uh, it was... It was amusing when you actually view the video because it's just me waiting for glue to dry and getting annoyed and uh, and saying random stuff in the background. Yeah, that video got taken down. It's a bit embarrassing. Uh, I've, I've put up over 1,500 videos. I screwed that one up. So it comes to the insert with the screen connection. We're not going to borrow the screen. We're only looking for pins 1, 2, and 3. And if you actually look on the... Uh, plastic itself, you'll see, rather helpfully, it embossed in black on a black background, so uh, good vision required for that. We've got the strain relief, which won't be needed. This is designed that when you screw the cover on, it clamps, it bites into the cable and gives it strain relief, while also shielding the connections from uh, shorting against the case. And this bit here, this is, it's quite nice. This one has a coloured shroud. Normally, they'd just be a black shroud. But this one's a coloured shroud, and if I get a screwdriver... The shroud is pushed in, it's like a grommet, the sort of strain relief here, at the black, the black bit at the back, and there's a little white uh, insert that goes in to jam that into place. So I'm going to put a screwdriver in here, and I'm going to push that out, because the idea is we want to 
pull this off, just keep this because we want to make it as small as possible. As I was mentioning there before I got distracted, I mentioned on Patreon that it'd be quite nice to make a little circuit board that stood up and it'd be nice just using this connector on its own without the metal shell because it'd make it much smaller and lighter on the keychain. But uh, that gives, the shell gives it lots of protection. You can imagine that in the pocket this would quickly get mashed, the pins get bent, but the three pin version, that might be viable. However, I mentioned you could put a little circuit board sticking up in the end and then you could pot it in resin. Someone said you could actually make a tiny little round circuit board that soldered on to, di directly to the pins and had surface mount LEDs and resistors in the front. You could, you could make this tiny, you know, literally that 30 millimeters long, uh, just over an inch long. Uh, with just a little keychain coming off the side. If you used a uh, shaped circuit board, you could even have the hole at the side for the actual keychain to go through the circuit board itself. It's got lots of possibilities. But this is how to do it if you don't have these facilities. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by cropping down the positive lead of the red LED to about just under a quarter of an inch, say about five millimetres. The positive lead is the long lead. So I'm going to crop that off. I'm going to other LED and I'm going to crop its long lead off too, down to about just under a quarter of an inch, five millimetres. And then, to see what length these are going to be, I'm going to put the insert back in here, stuff it down the inside, uh, screw this on the top, and then I'm going to place one of the LED leads into roughly pin one. Doesn't matter, just any pin will do. And I'm going to place it in, and it's sticking up above the end by about... That could get cropped down by, say, about a quarter of an inch. Because I want these LEDs to stick out slightly. So I shall crop them down by just over a quarter of an inch, which is about seven millimetres I'm going to crop it. And I'll do the same for both. In fact, I'll probably do them at the same time, just so they're both the same length. That seems like a logical thing to do. This is where I could also pause more entirely. So just free and cut this. That looks pretty good. This is where I could actually do with lifting this up a bit to a better height. So I'm just going to pause momentarily so we can focus and get to a better height to watch this happening. I'm back and I will make sure I'm actually recording in the correct sequence this time. So I'm going to pop the insert back out now. And I'm going to work out which is pin one, which is this pin here. I'm going to actually put a small dot with a sharpie on that just because it will make life easier. So I'm going to actually put a wee green dot on it just as a reminder, just so I don't mess up. Uh, numerically in the five pin connector, it's pin one, then two and three. So they're all just together. Then I'm going to get the solder. Have I got solder handy? Yes, I've got some solder here. And I'm going to put uh, into pin one I'm going to put the two negative leads and I'm just going to dangle the LEDs in like this. This is probably going to go horribly wrong, but it may work. It may not work. Let's try and get both these leads in together and just hook them in there. Oh, this could be a bit footeray. And then get the preheated solder iron. Make sure those are both at the same length. Make sure my finger's not on the pin that I'm soldering and then just flow some solder in. Hopefully I'm not going to knock the LEDs out in the process. That looks perfect. Okay. Now, I'm going to let that cool a bit until it's firmed up. I'm going to turn the LEDs round to make it easier to actually solder here. I'm going to get the two resistors, the two 220 ohm resistors. That's red, red, brown, 2, 2, and 1, which is 2, 2, and 1, 0. And I'm going to crop them down to about, let's say, just under a quarter of an inch, 5 millimeter. I'm going to put one of them into pin two. I'm kind of regretting cutting them down quite that far now because that is going in a bit too far. I want to actually, it doesn't matter. I can, uh, I can just hold it in position as I solder it and I shall do that right now. I want to, I don't want to ram the resistor right down hard against that uh, pin because there is a risk if you do that, that it's going to, uh, any angular leverage and it will damage the resistor. So I'm going to fumble this, uh, and by fumble I really mean fumble. Let's see if we can get the solder iron in and do this. 
use a, a helping hand or something if you, or get someone else to help you solder it if you, if you need uh, a bit of support for this. You could use the standard little uh, helping hand device. I'm going to flow that again. I'm just going to ease that resistor out just a tiny bit. The other option you could do here is what people often do when they're soldering the cables. You could flow solder into the receptacle like this. And you could flow a bit of solder onto the resistor. You could just tin it, moisten it with solder just to prepare the surface. Like this. Then heat it up again and just let that sit into the connector while keeping your finger clear of the hot pins other side. That looks good. So now we get that. The other end of those resistors, we're just going to crop them to, them to length to actually go to the adjacent LEDs. So, and this is going to be fairly easy to do because the try and actually cut these. Everything is now being held in place. So we can actually just line those leads up before we solder them, which is a lot easier than the, the previous version of the video that I made that I screwed up. So that looks pretty good. Now I shall flow some solder between these. Bridge them together. And these. That looks pretty good. And that is theoretically our tester made. This is when it might be useful to test it. If you want to test it, it's easy enough. You can get a bench power supply or batteries. Um, and you could just say, for instance, I've got this one set to about five volts. You could connect the negative to pin one and you could dab pin two and one LED lights, dab pin three, the other LED lights. So that's working fine. Now comes the interesting bit. You see, uh, I was experimenting earlier on with the best way to pot this in. In the past, I've done it with things like two part resin. And if you uh, look at this, you can see light shining through. If you put this into the housing, and there's an annoying trait of resin. If resin is in its sort of melting state, I'm just going to brighten this up a wee tad, that's better. I should have brightened up a lot more beforehand. Uh, the resin can go through here, and it can actually go down and into the sort of housing. You don't want that. If you're going to use just resin, I would recommend packing around this on both sides with, it's not used, this is the screen connection. Uh, I would recommend packing around both sides a bit, little bit of blue tack, even putting it in and just pressing that blue tack down around this in here and that will hopefully protect it from uh, I'm just going to uh, align these up just a little bit that will hopefully protect it from uh, flowing through into the bottom now I've actually adjusted those LEDs they are slightly different heights it doesn't really matter at all um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to initially I'm going to use hot melt glue. Hot melt glue has the huge advantage. This is actually a bit too bright, isn't it? It's, it's really bright. Not to worry. But I'm going to use hot melt glue as the first effort here because the advantage of hot melt glue is it's very good for a rough film, but it's not. It doesn't flow around things quite as well as the resin would. So I'm going to squirt some glue in here, and because it's highly viscous, it's not hopefully, going to go through that hole at the bottom. If any does start flowing through the housing, it will simply set as it goes through the housing. So that's now up to the top of the glue. Because it's viscous, we can also turn it upside down and check. Yeah, that looks fine. And I'm going to pause momentarily while this sets. Lastly, I'm going to be like, put this on. I could put this on now. It's very, very hot. Um, and this is also the point in time I'll just put the hot melt glue gun away before I name myself on it. This is also the point. I'm going to get a bit of copper wire. Now this copper wire is just a bit of house wiring wire that I've stripped. So it's a sort of solid core house wiring wire. You could use anything you want. I'm going to uh, get a pair of pliers, create it into a loop like this, 
possibly just for extra gripping strength, just flare it out at the bottom like that. I'm going to nudge these LEDs position-wise just to a roughly central position, and where there's space without shorting anything down there, I'm just going to stick this into the hot melt glue, and then I'm going to let it cool, and I'll be back shortly and try and not go out of sync with videoing and uh, pausing and stuff like that. Now the hot melt glue has had a chance to cure, I'm going to get some dollar store two-part resin, pound shop two-part resin, this is from Poundland. I'm going to squirt some into a shot glass, I like the shot glass, the shot glass also probably came from Poundland. I'm going to shoot a generous amount into that, if it's too viscous just uh, warm it up a little bit, but not too much. And put the cap on that before I spill resin everywhere, because it's such messy stuff. And then I'm going to take a wooden stir that I stole out of a local sh coffee shop called Conrod's. Conrod's is a coffee shop in Ramsey owned by Connor Cummins, uh, a famous TT racer. Infamous TT racer might be a better description. He's one of my neighbours in this street. He's uh, notable for uh, coming in pretty good result every year. Um, but also most notable for literally catapulting himself into fame. If you've ever seen those crazy TT crashes uh, videos, those compilations, unfortunately he's uh, the guy who uh, flies off the bike on the mountain road and catapults over the top of just missing solid rock walls and things like that. Yeah, that was an epic. That was not great. That was not a good experience for Connor. It made him famous, but just the wrong way. He could have done it like, uh, you know, like Guy. Guy, what, what's the, what is the guy? Guy Martin, who just, all he had to do was have a character and lots of big sideburns and things like that. But uh, no, Connor chose the hard route, unfortunately. Uh, and for those wondering, was he okay? It really wasn't. It took him a long time to recover from that. This is very runny. I might just actually try pouring it in. I did a... Uh, warm the resin slightly in front of a heater, so I shall try pouring it in. But yeah, so he, uh, Connor, when he's not uh, racing bikes at extraordinarily high speeds in a scary manner, he runs a coffee uh, industry here in the Isle of Man, we're supplying coffee. Coffee Man. And he has a coffee shop called Connor's, or Conrod, should I say, which I think is his nickname. All the racers tend to have sort of nicknames. For those wondering, do I watch the TT? Uh, it's not something that it's that easy to watch. It's a it's a bike race. Uh, if you don't know what it is, just YouTube Isle of Man TT, and you'll see that it all happens rather fast. So I'm putting far too much resin on here. I've I've really overdone it now. I shall encourage the resin to flow around. Now earlier on, I was saying that the hot melt glue isn't great for this because of the viscosity of the hot melt glue. It doesn't actually work quite as well as resin for this, that you can basically just nudge, break the surface tension, it'll fill round. Um, and this resin should cure in two minutes. The attempt with hot melt glue before was terrible. It just, it went down one side, then stuck, it wouldn't flow between the LEDs. But now it has, it's fine, because I've used the resin to finish this. Each has its own merits. And now I'm going to pause to let this cure, and it's not going to take that long, because uh, it is just, uh, it's five minute cure resin, so it will be done uh, in a few minutes, so I'll be back shortly. Okay, the resin is cured. All I need is a source of DMX to test it. Let's plug it into a DMX stream, and the LEDs start shimmering backwards and forwards. It's a very visible shimmer. This is the normal sort of refresh rate of DMX. You can actually see a sort of jittering. You'll also notice in some instances, depending on whether it's transmitting uh, all channels at full or all channels at zero, that one of the LEDs will have an intensity bias. It will be slightly dimmer than the other. But the main thing is that both LEDs should be shimmering and there should be a slight backwards and forwards between them. If one of the LEDs is lit on its own, let's see if I can emulate that just by putting it in badly and make a bad connection. If one LED is flickering like that, that's bad. That means you've lost one of your data lines. And likewise, if the other one's flashing, that's a lost data line. If nothing's lighting, that's also bad. That means either there's no data there in the first place or you've lost your uh, ground reference. In these instances, what you do is you'd maybe go back to the source first. Uh, if n none of the lights in the stream working, and you'd plug it into the output and see if you are getting any DMX at all, any sort of sh shimmering. Now, there's something I should mention here. 
This can this just tests the wires, but it doesn't tell you if they've been swapped. Technically speaking, if you were kind of if you're working in such a dark environment, you saw there was a different intensity in one of them, you could find cables with them swapped, but it doesn't easily determine if the wires have been swapped, but that is kind of rare. The most uh, likely scenarios on a job are either damaged cables where things have been shorted out because the cables have been chaffed or crushed, or cables that have been stretched by local crew who were trying to plug in a light and the cable wasn't long enough so they just gave it a wee drag um, and burst the connections off the inside. That is very common. Um, but, so it won't uh, test the, the uh, polarity around. All it does is give you a rough indication of presence of the signal in the first place. But having said that, if you've got a, a signal like this and, uh, and it looks fairly strong, the intensity of the LEDs will show roughly the strength of the signal, then uh, the light itself may indicate that, you know, there's an issue with the DMX being swapped. It might just not work. If you do find that you've got, say, a broken line uh, along a large run of lights, say you're just getting the one LED, then what you do is you'd go halfway down that run of lights and you'd unplug it, the network, and you'd plug this in. And if at that point you saw that they were both working, you'd then know that the between the original point and that point, the fault's in there and you'd divide it in two and you'd go and split it. And you'd just keep splitting it in binary until you found the fault. Likewise, if you plugged it in halfway down the stream, the fault was still there, then you'd know it was in that half of the stream, so you'd actually then go down, uh, divide that into multiples, uh, testing it. It's just, it'll come intuitively. But this is, uh, without doubt, one of the most useful little pocket testers. You do get things like the Swiss On or the DMX Cat that have increased functionality. They allow you to do things like... Uh, put test signals out to you can actually set channels or read the channels that are on the on the network um, and they also in the case of uh, rdm enabled lights with bi-directional communication they also let you uh, set addresses and parameters and lights that you can't do that with this but the advantage of this one is that it's on your keychain it's there whenever you need it and seriously i find this such a useful tool for troubleshooting dmx lines it's just worth its weight in gold so um that's it. It's very simple to make and it's very simple to use. It is an invaluable little tool and, well, what can I say? Very easy to make and cheap to make and it can be carried on your keyring.